On June 13th to June 15th, 2022, the Brazil-Canada Chamber of Commerce will be hosting the 16th edition of the Brazil-Canada Conference at PDAC, taking place in person in Toronto. We're also hosting the second Brazil-Canada Virtual Mining Conference that started on March 7th. We'll continue until May 31st. I'm Carolina Alberna, CEO of the Brazil-Canada Chamber of Commerce, and I'm here today with Randy Smallwood, President and Chief Executive Officer at Wheaton Precious Metals Corp. So, Randy, welcome, and thank you so much for being here today. Carolina, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so why don't we start by introducing yourself and uh, introducing uh, Wheat and Precious Metals. Sure, uh, and thanks. Uh, name's Randy Smallwood, uh, President and CEO of Wheat and Precious Metals. I was part of the founding team when we created this company back in 2004. Um, we created the streaming business model, which is a, it's a bit unique in the sense that it's a, it's a partnership between an operating company and a financing company like us, where we supply financing. But for, for that financing, for that capital that we supply, we get access to actual metal that's being produced from the mine sites themselves. And so uh, our particular focus, as the name implies, wheat and precious metals is, is precious metals, gold and silver. But what we recognize is that a lot of gold and silver gets produced as a non-core byproduct from copper mines and lead zinc mines, base metal mines, nickel mines, et cetera. And even silver as a byproduct, non-core byproduct from gold mines. And so, so our particular focus is to go around and find the strongest uh, um, um, base metal or, or, or mines in the world and, and, and focus on trying to purchase their non-core precious metals byproduct. And, uh, and it's, it's been an incredible success. We, as I said, we started the company in 2004. We really didn't put serious focus into the company until 2007. Uh, we started putting a whole corporate development team around this and, uh, and uh, it's now grown into the largest streaming company in the world. Uh, and I think one of the best ways to invest into precious metals, but more importantly, it also supplies capital to the mining industry that's very competitive in today's world. Uh, we do take operating risk, production risk on these assets, which is a key differentiator between us and normal debt or normal sources of capital. We're more like an equity partner, like a shareholder in these assets. So uh, we can surpass the 10 billion mark in total streaming mm -hmm. investment in mining since inception this past year. Uh, looking back over the past 18 years, what do you attribute the success to? I think it's sticking to our principles, sticking to the principles of investing into good, solid mines run by strong operating teams that have a, you know, and a lot of times if it's a development project, you have to, you have to first off, recognize that there's enough strength in the asset itself to drive good quality operations, but secondly, to make sure you have the proper partners uh, and partnerships. And so I think if there's one thing that differentiates Wheaton from, from a lot of the, the, the rest of the peer group, to be honest, it's, it's, our focus on partnership, we put a lot of effort into providing value to our partners. We have an overlying mantra in our company that the stronger our partners are, the stronger we are. And, it's, uh, and, and so we do, we, we owe it to our partners, we owe it to all of our stakeholders to try and, and be constructive in adding value on a continuous basis, not just up front. And I, and I really do think that that's differentiated Wheaton from its peer group. I yeah, know it's definitely a good mantra to, to live by for sure. Um, so you recently announced the commitment to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. What roadmap and subsequent actions will be undertaking to help reach these ambitions, ambitious goals? Well, and, and proud to say that Wheaton's actually been carbon neutral on a scope one, scope two basis since 2015. So we were you know, ahead of the game, I think, on that in the mining space. But scope three is something that we do have to wrap ourselves around. And, and really for us, scope three is the emissions that come from the mine sites where our metal is being produced. And so because we have such a diverse group of uh, partners, um, you know, we haven't seen a, a level of consistency across, uh, across the spectrum of our partnerships in terms of each company, each one of our partners is treating this differently in terms of how they're going forward. So our first objective, of course, is to quantify, to understand what portion of the uh, of the emissions from these operations we are liable for in terms of moving forward and we've we've made some really good progress here early this year in terms of uh, trying to come up with a framework that allows us to estimate that and now and then it's uh, towards uh, over the next um, you know in fact i hope you know hope this is a schedule we all beat yeah. but uh, over the next few years trying to work towards coming up with solutions that help in the mining industry, one of the biggest challenges is where does the power come from? Where does the, you know, what's the power supply? And the other advantage, the other opportunity that we have in our company is that a lot of times we're supplying capital while a mine is being built versus an existing operation. And so because we're at that development phase, 
we can help our partners make better decisions from that perspective. If it means that a bit of extra capital to, to shift to run a river hydroelectric or solar power, uh, you know, uh, as opposed to, you know, relying on diesel generators or, or challenges like that, you know, there, there's lots of opportunity at the development phase to help our partners make better decisions. And so it's a real key opportunity for us and a, and a focus for us here. Yeah, no, this is this is uh, great, and it does help, right? Like since the beginning, so you start already on the right path. Yes. Um, talking a little bit about ESG and the partners and the partnership that you mentioned. So we can surpass the thirty million mark in formal contributions and donations to support community programs and not-for-profit organizations around yours and your partners' local communities. Why is community investment so important to you? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's an easy one uh, because that's the only way we all survive. Yeah, we all have to. I mean, in society, we we all have to do our best to sort of enhance and strengthen the community around us. It's not just about the balance sheet. It's not just about uh, the ledger. You have to you have to put you have to give some back. And and we at Wheaton, uh, you know, and I would say the mining industry as a whole has had some incredible good fortune, especially in the past two years with the pandemic. And so when, whenever someone has that good fortune, I think, uh, you know, humanity, I mean, it's, it's a requirement for us to make sure that we do our best to help those that are less fortunate on a go forward basis and strengthen it. And so when it comes to partnerships, again, uh, helping our partners be more sustainable, helping making sure that all the other stakeholders are getting their benefit, their, their share of the benefits from a well-run operation. Uh, mining is so unique in terms of the amount of value that it creates for society from, you know, from downstream in terms of the consumers of the metal uh, as we electrify this world to the taxes that are being paid to the investments in the community um, um, uh, infrastructure, uh, strengthening other, you know, supporting other small businesses and micro businesses in the area around the mine sites. There's just so much positive that comes out of mines and, and it, we owe it as, as we get metal from these mines. Uh, you know, I think it's important that we do give back. And, uh, and I think it's a requirement that we do give back. And it's a bit of a shame of the traditional royalty space that they that they they always took, but they never gave back to the community. And I'm glad that that as a peer group, we are now starting to see consistently all the streaming and royalty companies now focus on on, on giving something back to the communities around the mine sites that that they get their metal from or they get their, their revenue from. So uh, it's an important, very important aspect of, of good sound business. Yeah, and it's usually communities who are very, uh, that need that economic development, right? And uh, they need that support. Uh, I, I've, I've always yeah. said, I've always said the, the most incredible opportunity we have in the mining industry is that we can change the standard of living in rural locations. Yeah. You know, so much of society now is pushing populations towards the urban locations and away from the rural locations. And, and if people want to improve their standard of living, they tend to wind up getting pulled towards the cities. And, and that's a shame because, uh, you know, it's just going to get tougher and tougher in those urban centers as we concentrate there. And so the mining industry has an incredible opportunity to really <laughs> elevate the standard of living in rural locations. Yeah, no, you have a great point there. Uh, so do you anticipate we can be as active on the corporate development uh, front in 2022? Yeah, we've we've seen a lot. Right now, we, we seem to have a niche for single asset development companies. There's a lot of uh, a lot of companies coming forward where they only have one asset in their portfolio and they're working towards construction, a construction decision on it. And, uh, and in that space, we're actually quite competitive from, a, from an equity partner perspective. Um, you know, the streams that we purchase uh, are, are much better valued than what the market is treating the other equity sources that, uh, that these companies have. And so for that reason, we are very busy. These commodity prices have driven uh, a real strong... Um, uh, interest in terms of uh, advancing projects towards con the construction decision and as they need to source capital uh, we're, we're, we're pretty hopeful we've already had a couple of deals close uh, uh, here in 2022 and we expect to have a few more before the end of the year and are there any jurisdictions outside of the Americas that currently interest you we look at everything and we've we put many bids in on Australian assets and on African assets and even some assets in Asia but, you know, we, we do try and capture risk in our valuations. And it's quite clear that in some of these jurisdictions, uh, our competitors don't value the risk or they don't, uh, they don't see the risks that we do. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's clear that since we don't have assets in those jurisdictions, that, that however we're, we're capturing that risk to try and, and, and offset that with the potential benefits, 
uh, we're, we're not successful. We continue to look. It's, it's important to understand what our competitors are doing, what they're paying for it. Um, we don't have any regrets in that. We'll continue to look uh, by, by all means. The more we see, the, 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 the smarter we are, the better decisions we make. And, and so we'll, we'll continue to look in those spaces and, uh, and I'm confident that we will eventually get there, but there's no doubt that the Americas, you know, we, we, we also have to remember that Wheaton was originally focused, uh, the original founding company was Silver Wheaton and it was focused on silver. And of course, silver, Mexico and Peru are very, very important to us and still to this day are very important. But now that we've gone into gold, the rest of the Americas, including Brazil, of course, uh, um, has become incredibly important to us also. And uh, so, you know, uh, the Americas are definitely attractive. We'll look elsewhere, but uh, I, I see us as continuing to be an America-centric company. So uh, you mentioned your competition. The roach and streaming space have gotten a little bit more crowded in recent years as the model has become more popular. What could you tell investors about evaluating royalty and streaming companies? Well, not all streams are equal. Um, you know, what we've seen is a lot of the, uh, the smaller companies that are trying to get their foot into the door in this business are giving up structural flaws in, 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 the, in the deals in order to get their foot in the door. And sometimes it's because it's being packaged up with off takes or converts or debt financing and all bundled up and then obviously you know, passed off to... Uh, to you know, uh, other companies, we've seen that consistently from the private equity side uh, as they uh, as they move stuff in, and uh, you have to look at the structure. These streams do not have; they either have buyout clauses, they have limited areas of interest, they have aggressive step downs, they have ounce caps. They're just you know they're not really streams. They're they're hybrids that actually have a lot lower upside potential from a perspective, from a shareholder's perspective, than uh, than a traditional Wheaton stream, and so. You really do have to understand that's that's the key thing is that we've seen some real structural flaws and we've seen some of those mid-tier companies suffer from those uh, structural flaws as it becomes apparent that uh, that these things aren't as attractive and, and so there's there's a reason i've always believed the market is incredibly efficient in terms of valuations and there's a reason that uh, that that wheaton and and, uh, and some of the larger peers trade at premiums is because because you know we have good sound um uh structures around the streams that we produce that we have. And uh, do you feel there will be a flurry of streaming sector consolidation like some have predicted? Well, I think it's natural. Anytime any, any, anything in, in nature overpopulates, there's always going to be some form of consolidation or narrowing it down. It, it's interesting, though, because, you know, the appeal of stepping up and buying um, something at the trades at a bit of a premium to net asset value when you when we have opportunities to also continue growing and invest directly into mine sites at, at better valuations. Uh, my preference is to continue to put money into the ground on new opportunities versus, you know, picking up someone else's portfolio. That being said, sometimes there's opportunities there. If the market recognizes some of the weakness in, in some of these other companies' portfolios and, and starts valuing them appropriately, then they may become attractive to, to a group like us. But but, you know, I just don't see it happening a lot. Uh, you know, um, our, our focus is to continue growing. We've, we've actually been able to maintain a pretty continuous pipeline in terms of new opportunities. And I can tell you, we're still busy looking at new opportunities. So, so that's, that's where I see the focus. So you mentioned in the beginning of our conversation about the protection of the risks, right? So we protected from many of the risks that mining companies face. And one of the, those risks right now is inflation. How do you see inflation impacting companies to the mining in the mining space? And to what extent is it a problem and what steps are companies taking to deal with it? Well, again, that's one of the other um, areas of risk is making sure that you invest into mines and assets that have healthy operating margins, not only for the streaming company, but also for the operator. It's a real key importance and uh, a key important factor in terms of ensuring that because you want to make sure that there's good, strong, healthy margins so that if there is inflation risk, if there is increases in taxation, if there is, you know, other associated costs that happen in these environments, that the mine is still going to be profitable for the operating partners. So at Wheaton, we really put a focus on the first and second quartile assets. And I think 85% of our current production comes from the bottom half of the respective cost curve. It's an incredibly important uh, factor in terms of quality. Because that's what drives, you know, not only are these mines very profitable for us, they're also profitable for all the other stakeholders, including the governments, the local governments, the federal governments, wherever, in terms of taxation revenue and such. And so there's a real strong incentive to make sure that if there is issues, 
that these issues get uh, corrected or fixed uh, as soon as possible. And so, you know, when it comes to that, you just want to make sure you have that protection. And of course, from a, a Wheaton shareholder perspective, because all of our contracts have fixed production payments on a per ounce basis as that metal is delivered to us, we don't have inflationary risks. Our risks do not climb with that inflation. So as long as our partners are healthy and can manage that increase in inflationary pressures, fortunately, that usually comes with higher commodity prices, which you know, largely offset some of that for the mining companies. But we don't see that. Our costs are fixed by, by, uh, by the contract. And so therefore, you know, I would argue that Wheaton is the perfect hedge against inflation in the, in the precious metal space. Uh, so I mentioned about talking about inflation, right? Uh, we can um, we cannot mention energy. So with higher energy prices, do you anticipate margins getting squeezed? Of course, uh, energy is one of the highest cost centers within any mining operation, and so there's no doubt it's going to have an impact. Again, underscoring the importance of making sure that the assets that you invest into that there's a healthy operating margin for all the stakeholders. If if even if local communities and governments aren't getting their tax, that's that's just not sustainable. If the operators aren't getting their share of profits, it's not sustainable. You have to make sure that the assets are healthy. That's why there's a limit in terms of what you can actually do within the streaming space. You have to make sure that 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 all the stakeholders are benefiting from this uh, from this partnership. And uh, does Witten operate differently in terms of doing deals and building relationships when metal prices are rising versus when they fall flat or uh, are falling? Well, in our experience, it's been now, what, 17, 17 years now, I guess, or 18 years. In, in our experience, um, there are what I would say three seasons to streaming. <laughs> the, the development phase, which we're currently in right now, which is where most of the opportunities we're looking at, it's money going into the ground to help companies grow, help them build new mines and, and invest in brand new infrastructure, sometimes even brownfields infrastructure. But but nevertheless, it's, it's all money going directly into the ground. Um, the second, second phase after that typically is what we call the harvest season, which is um, it's a frothy market. There's lots of capital available. Equities are well-priced. Um, not a lot of opportunity for us to supply capital. But that's not a problem because we've already got a portfolio, a well uh, diversified and, and broad portfolio of assets that we harvest from over that period in time. And, and I would say that we did that really from about 2010 through to about 2013, uh, where we didn't do any, uh, any transactions, but, but generated a lot of cash flow and built up a bit of a war chest. The third season is we, uh, we call the balance sheet repair season, and it usually follows the harvest season. Whenever the market is frothy, people start making riskier investments and, and based on higher prices. And then all of a sudden you see, you know, you have to recognize the mining industry is cyclical. Commodity prices are cyclical. And so there's going to be a downside. And when that downside happens, we want to be there with a strong balance sheet ready to uh, help companies uh, correct their own uh, balance sheet and, and de-lever, take care of some of the debt that might be uh, wearing them down. And so from really for, for our purposes, we, from 2013 through to about 2018, most of our transactions were more about balance sheet repair, where we were helping companies take debt off their balance sheets and strengthen up their own uh, capacity to go forward. And so, so those are the three seasons. Currently, we are in the development uh, phase where just about everything we're looking at right now is, uh, is, is uh, development growth. What that, if, if, if it falls a natural order in terms of what we've seen today, soon there will be a frothy period where when, when we start seeing investors coming back into the space and all of a sudden uh, shares are, are better traded and then we'll sit back and harvest. Yeah, and that was part of my next question. Like you're always very good on modeling those cycles, right, for the mining industries. So where is the industry right now? Well, I think we're still at the upside. I, I, I just, when I look at the, um, the demand and the expectations around the world in terms of electrifying this planet, the amount of copper that we're going to need, the amount of nickel we're going to need, the amount of cobalt we're going to need, it's just a, a huge shortage. And then I look at, you know, from financial markets and I look at it from a precious metals perspective. I don't think there's ever been a need for gold more than there is now in terms of, uh, you know, uh, capacity and, 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 you know, preserving value uh, from an investing perspective. Gold is uh, in an inflationary environment. It's incredibly important in terms of providing that, that basis, that substance. And so, so, you know, I think these are exciting times. Uh, you know, I do believe that with the, uh, with the demand that we're going to see and, and, and 
correct demand in terms of, you know, we need to move forward. We need to start decarbonizing the world and shift to greener sources of, uh, of energy. And we all want that standard of living to, you know, gradually improve all the way around the world. But that doesn't come without a cost. We do need to somehow supply metals for this. And when, when you start looking at the demand curves, the demand forecast on a go forward basis, uh, I think it bodes very, very well for the mining industry. So I, I think we've still got some good growth in front of us. Uh, so to finalize, I mean, I've been like we came from a two year pandemic period. And now we're dealing with a war uh, with involving Russia and, and Ukraine. So what is the impact on the overall gold market? Uh, uh, do you think potential sanctions on Russia's ability to liquidate its gold reserves could have? Well, I don't know if Russia should liquidate its gold reserves. It, uh, you know, when I sit and think about what, what reserves are there for in terms of providing stability uh, in, within a, a central bank's reserve base, uh, gold acts perfectly for them because uh, from, a, from a political perspective, it's not U.S. dollars. And of course, U.S. dollars would be out of favor there. And so it would really surprise me to see Russia liquidating its gold reserves. Um, you know, they, they can, of course... Um, source other capital as every other central bank in the world has done. And so gold is probably the, the strongest component of their foreign reserves right now. So it would really surprise me if, I, if, if we saw Russia doing that. So, you know, I, 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 I don't expect that to be an issue. It's, you know, I think they, more than anyone right now, probably recognize the value of having gold in their, in their reserve base. And so, uh, um, you know, hopefully <laughs> it's a tragedy what's going on in the Ukraine yeah, right now. I do hope there's a there's an end to this very, very soon. Uh, um, you know, but um, <laughs> best wishes to everyone involved in that. And hopefully, hopefully it does finish off well. I agree with you. Well, Randy, thank you very, very much for your time and support. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time for this conversation. Wheaton Precious Metals is a gold sponsor of the 16th edition of the Brazil-Canada Conference at PDAC Series of Events. And we're looking forward to be hosting Randy and the Wheaton Precious uh, Metals team in Toronto in June, as he's going to be one of the speakers of our exclusive Brazil-Canada Capital Markets and Mining Financing Breakfast Session taking place uh, on June 14th. So, Randy, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you in person here in Toronto in June for some uh, summer PDAC. And uh, for more information about our events and for registrations, please go to www.braskenchamber.org slash PDAC 2022. We look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina.